Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. Today we have a very special treat that Jian Ding, who left the University of Pennsylvania and now is in Beijing at Peking University, is going to be our speaker. And we're looking forward very much to hear his recent work on progress on the random fieldizing model. So John, please share your screen. Th thanks, Arthur. Uh, th thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Can you see my? Can you see my screen? Yes, it works perfectly. Great. So, uh, it's a pleasure that I have this chance to report some recent progress on random field IC model. I see at least the two real experts in the in the audience. Uh, this is based on joint works with uh, Jian Song from uh, Shandong University, Rongfeng Sang from uh, National, University, National University of Singapore, Matteo Worth, uh, Jamin Shah, Zijie Zhuang. Uh, they were or they are graduate students at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so uh, let me first uh, define what is uh, the easy model. It's a model for magnetization. Mathematically speaking, while well, it can be defined on a general graph or even a general network, but uh, for simplicity, let's just fo focus on uh, lattices. Uh, we consider a box, as I, as I show you in this picture, uh, a configuration assigns each vertex in the box either a plus spin or a minus spin as drawing the picture. Uh, it's in blue or in red. And we pose some boundary conditions, uh, uh, as I show in the picture. The boundary condition can be arbitrary, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, we, we are mostly care about or plus uh, or, or minus boundary conditions, and the reasons will become uh, clear soon. Now, with all these notations, we can define what is a Hamiltonian for a configuration. Uh, it's defined in this uh, mathematical display. Uh, you see here, there's a minus sign. The minus sign follows the uh, physics convention. And then there are two terms, two blue terms in this, uh, in this display. The first term uh, incorporates the uh, spin interactions across neighboring pairs. And the second term uh, incorporates uh, the spin interactions with the boundary conditions. The plus minus in red co corresponds to the plus minus boundary conditions uh, we pose on the boundary. Now, with the Hamiltonian defined, we can define the easy measure uh, at any non-negative temperature t. Uh, for this talk, I'm only caring about ferromagnetic easy model, so the temperature is always non-negative. Uh, the measure is given by, it's a probability measure. The probability on each configuration is proportional to exponential of minus one over t times the Hamiltonian. We see from uh, the definition that uh, the easy measure favors configurations with the more agreeing neighboring pairs. Uh, and the smaller T is, the, the lower the temperature is, uh, this effect is stronger. A very interesting question is that whether such uh, local spin interactions uh, lead to the long range order. Before answering this question, let's, uh, even though we have intuitive understanding what is long range order, let's uh, define it in a mathematical way. It, it can be measured by the boundary influence, which is the difference of the spin averages uh, at the origin with the plus and the min minus boundary conditions. And by symmetry, this is just the spin average with the plus boundary conditions. Uh, one, one of the nice properties of the easy model is its monotonicity. Uh, so also, I use a plus minus, plus dominant uh, uh, minus. So the, if we look at the boundary conditions, the plus boundary condition is the maximum boundary condition, and the uh, uh, minus boundary condition is the minimum boundary condition. And what's more, the, the law of the easing, easing spins given the plus and the minus boundary conditions is also the max, max law and the ma minus law, which means uh, for any other boundary conditions in between, uh, its, its law of the spins can be sandwiched by the uh, plus and the minus boundary conditions. That's why 
we, we, we only have to look at plus and minus boundary conditions uh, in order to measure the boundary influence because the difference of the spin average at plus and minus boundary conditions is the largest possible differences that the boundaries can make to the spin average at the origin. Uh, and then we say long range order exists if uh, boundary influence stays above a positive constant as uh, the size of the box goes to the infinite. Uh, in in Ethan's, uh, I think in his thesis in 20s, he showed that uh, in one dimension, there is no long range order at any positive temperature. And uh, in 30s, Pales proved that uh, in two dimensions and above, Long range order exists at low temperatures, but not at high temperatures. So this uh, in particular shows there is a phase transition uh, in the behavior. The Pierce result is uh, of uh, historic importance because I think that's one of the main reasons uh, that Isimodo attracts so much uh, uh, attention and study from both physicists and the mathematicians. There has been a lot of uh, uh, progress on both physics side and also on the mathematical side in understanding uh, the Ising model uh, in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, higher dimensions. Uh, some of the uh, some of these uh, uh, progresses are made by audiences uh, uh, here. Uh, I will not talk. I will not uh, discuss all these results, and uh, they. I will just focus on the the behavior of the long range order for the easy model. So I would like to give you, a, I mean, this is in general a review talk, but I would like to sketch uh, the Pierce argument because I think this is a very nice argument and probably can be used in some form elsewhere in your research. So I just want to sketch the argument how to show that at a low temperature, uh, there is long range order. Uh, when dimension is uh, two or above, so so that that means we want to show with plus boundary condition, uh, this being average or at origin uh, is is positive, or we just want to show with the large probability at low temperature with the plus boundary condition with large probability the origin also takes a plus spin. So basically, we want to compare the probability measures of two set of configurations, right? One is when the when the origin is takes a, a a plus spin. The other is when the origin takes a minus spin. Of course, one way to compare probabilities is just you can compute this directly. This is usually hard to compute things directly. Another way, which is a bit indirect, to compare uh, probabilities of two sets uh, is as follows. We can first look at a simpler question. Suppose we have two finite sets. How do we compare the size of the two sets? If we can construct a bijection between the two sets, then we know that they must have the same number of elements, right? But okay, maybe we cannot construct a bijection. Maybe we can construct a mapping from one to the other. And if that's the case, then we want to understand what's the multiplicity of the mapping uh, in order to compare the sizes of the, of the two sets. And maybe the, the, the element does not carry the same measure so, so not only we want to keep track of the multiplicity of the mapping, we also want to uh, compare the ratio for the probabilities for the element, for, for, for an element and its image under this mapping, right? Suppose we can control both of this, then we, we should be able to convince ourselves that we, are, we would be able to uh, compare the total measures of these two sets. This is the general idea and can be used in a very general setup. The, as you can see, the difficulty in, imply, in, in using this idea is to construct a nice mapping, which on the one hand is tractable and on the other hand serves your purpose, right? And that's exactly, I think, the main contribution of Pears. He finds uh, a very natural and a nice mapping for the question of long range order uh, for the EC model. So suppose we start with an undesirable set, the set where the the spin at the uh, the spin at the origin is uh, is is minus, so it disagrees with the, the boundary condition. We want to map it to a configuration so that 
uh, the spin at the origin becomes plus. How, how does uh, how does pairs do it? So he finds the minus component, which is what I draw on the left hand uh, on the picture on the left hand side. It is the, the the minus component is the red component. He draws the he, he finds the minus component, and then he he draws out the outermost boundary of this component. This is the orange boundary I showed you in the picture, and then. And then the mapping flips this beam that is enclosed by this boundary, by this orange boundary. So that not only includes red spins enclosed by the orange boundary, but also the blue, blue spins uh, enclosed by this uh, orange boundary. And then we arrive at a picture on the right hand side. And in particular, now the, 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 the spin at the origin is flipped. It changes from minus to plus. Okay, that's the construction of the mapping. Now we need to analyze the mapping. As I said earlier, there are two things we need to keep track of. One is the multiplicity. One is the change of the probability. Let's first look at the change of probability. You see, the only change of Hamiltonian occurs along this orange boundary, right? In all the other places, the, the, the product of the spins, uh, the product of the spins for neighboring pairs uh, remain the same. The only change is along the orange orange contour. It was it was a uh, uh, disagreement before flipping, and it became and it, it and it becomes uh, agreement after flipping. So because of this, the probability increased by effect of exponential in L over T. However, we also need to uh, look at the multiplicity. The multiplicity basically is the number of ways to choose this contour, right? The number of ways to choose this green contour on the right hand side. Uh, the number of contours uh, of size L is, uh, is just exponential in L uh, in, 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 in lattices. So if T is small enough, we can draw the conclusion that indeed the, the set of configurations on the right hand side has larger, much larger probability than the right hand side. This says that. Uh, the, the spin is very much likely to be a plus, uh, which is exactly what we wanted for the existence of the long range order. Okay, so this is the argument uh, to to show the to show the uh, 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 long range order exists. We are going to revisit this argument uh, toward the end of the talk. Now let's move to the main object that we want to talk about for today's talk: the random field AC model. Basically, we just introduced some disorder. Uh, to the system. Uh, first, for simplicity, let's uh, just consider independent standard Gaussian variables uh, for the disorder. So they are ID, mean zero, and uh, the variance is one. Uh, and then we want to define the random field easy mode Hamiltonian. Uh, we want to give a, a, a parameter epsilon, which measures the strength of the disorder. So the Hamiltonian is defined very similar to the original Hamiltonian. Just on top of that, we add another term. Uh, that's the term in blue. I said add, but I, I, here is a minus sign because this minus sign inherit, inherits from the uh, minus sign, the definition of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian uh, in the first slide. This blue term incorporates, the, the blue term we just added, uh, incorporates the, the spin interaction with the external field. Uh, you see that with this blue term, the the spin tend to be, the spin tend to agree with the sign of the external field, and the larger epsilon is, the larger the this uh, the stronger this effect is. Okay. Uh, similarly, we can define the random field easy model measure. Uh, it's uh, uh, proportional to the, the measure assigned to each configuration. It it's proportional to exponential of the minus one of t times the Hamiltonian. It's just now we use the, the random field of Eastern Hamiltonian. Uh, maybe I should comment that this measure itself is a random variable, which depends on the uh, disorder. And uh, another comment is that at zero temperature, the, uh, this measure, this random field Eastern measure is supported on the ground states. Uh, well, I said ground states, that's actually incorrect. Should, it's supported on the ground state, which is unique, almost surely, 
Uh, that's because the Gaussian distribution is continuous, and as a result, it usually has a single, uh, typically has a single uh, uh, minimizer for the Hamiltonian. Uh, without without disorder, the the ground state is uh, is quite obvious. If it's all plus boundary condition, this is all plus. If it's all minus boundary conditions, it's all minus. Uh, but with the presence of disorder, the structure of the uh, of the ground state becomes actually quite uh, quite complicated. Uh, again, we can define a, a, a boundary influence or, or on spin mechanization, uh, which is just the uh, the spin average. The spin average, the difference for the spin average is at the at the origin with the plus and the minus boundary conditions, uh, and we we also average over the of the of the external field, of the random external field. Uh, the bracket here means the expectation with respect to the to to the easy measure. Uh, the main question for today is how does the random field affects uh, affect the the long range order? Uh, that is to say, what is the lim limiting behavior for this boundary influence? So, as a first guess is since we have proved the long range order uh, using pairs argument for easy model without external field, naturally we want to say we want to ask ourselves whether we can still apply pairs argument when there is disorder. Well, the answer is no, uh, since the random field also has influence on the probability change for the flip mapping we introduced. And what's worse, such influence uh, depends on the configuration we start with. And as a result, a uniform bound is usually not possible. So if we do a uniform bound, that usually is not good enough. Uh, that's the kind of the technical reason why Pierce argument cannot be directly applied. Uh, we, we just follow the argument line by line. We see here is the place that that has has an issue, but there is even more fundamental reason why Pierce argument cannot just uh, be applied as is, uh, because the behavior can indeed be drastically different. For instance, if uh, if epsilon is large, that is when the disorder is strong, then uh, in the series of work it was shown that uh, the the boundary influence. Uh, has exponential decay in any dimension. So this destroys the long range order. It's, it's not too surprising because when epsilon is large, that means the, the, the effect from the external field is really strong. So basically uh, uh, the, the spin just tend to agree with uh, the sign of the external field there. Uh, in, in the appendix of uh, Eisenman Pellet 18, they give a very nice calculation argument to show the exponential decay uh, for the at a zero temperature. So it's like a one page argument, but uh, I don't have time to show you here. The, the, the main issue now is uh, what happens when the, uh, when the disorder, when the strength of the disorder is weak. This is also, this is more challenging and also I think more interesting. Uh, so here is the physics prediction by Imran and Ma in the 70s. So for small epsilon, they predicted that long range order exists uh, for three dimensions and higher at low temperatures. And for two dimensions, there is no long range order. Here is a very rough underlying intuition of uh, Imran and Ma. They look at the Gaussian volume, that is just the sum of the Gaussian disorder in a, in, in a set. So if we look at the Gaussian volume in a, in a box, uh, it, well, just by checking what is the standard deviation, what, uh, we get that the typical order is uh, n to the power of d over two, okay? And then the boundary effect should be measured by the size of the boundary, that's n to the power of d minus one. When d is great equal to three, then the boundary effect is much larger than the Gaussian volume. Uh, and in this case, the uh, predict that the boundary influence should persist. When d equal to two, they become comparable. So even though even though the Gaussian volume comes with another small constant epsilon, in this case, they predict that uh, the fluctuation of the Gaussian should uh, 
should dominate in the end and destroy the long range order. There are uh, quite some difficulties for proving Imrama's prediction, uh, partly because I think the intuition is it's kind of rough. Uh, for instance, when in three dimensions, we just said that if we look at a, a, a fixed box, typically the boundary size is much larger than the Gaussian volume. But there is random set. We can find random connected sets such that uh, the, the Gaussian volume uh, yeah, the Gaussian volume is much larger than the than the uh, than the size of the boundary. For instance, we start with the we start with the box, a 3D box, and we just throw away n square vertices with the list of field values. In this way, from a simple calculation, we see that the remaining set should have large Gaussian volume because we have dropped out all these small Gaussian values uh, uh, in the in the box. So, so this this property of the uh, Boundary size beats the Gaussian volume does not hold for all sets. Uh, in even even does not even hold for all connected sets. So this this is another reason. Uh, this echoes with the obstacle that Peirce argument would uh, would face. And in two dimensions, if epsilon is small, we need the collective influence from disorder on a large set to fight against the boundary effect. But there's no clear reason why should they collaborate. So those are the main difficulties, I think, as far as I can tell, uh, improving uh, Imrama's uh, prediction. So here comes the uh, celebrated work of uh, Eisman and Well in the nineties, where they showed that the boundary influence does go to zero uh, in two dimensions for any for any epsilon. Uh, here is a sketch of the, of the argument. They, they work with the uh, free energy difference uh, with the plus and the minus boundary conditions, where the free energy is just minus t times the log of the partition function. And the partition function is the sum in this display, the sum over all configurations of the uh, exponential of minus one over t times the Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is. For those who are uh, familiar with uh, some of this physics uh, terminology, this should be a, a, a natural definition. So first observation is that deterministically, the, this free energy difference is bounded by twice of uh, the size of the boundary, which is say 16 times m. And this can be done using a short arguments, a few lines arguments, and it's also a it's a straightforward comparison of Hamiltonians uh, for Hamiltonians for the same configuration with a plus and minus boundary condition. And this this gave you this uh, th this upper bound which holds uh, deterministically. So so now it suffices it suffices to show that if the long range order exists if the boundary influence stays above a constant, then with a the positive probability, the free energy difference is larger than say 16 times n. If, well, if one can show this, then by contradiction, we get what we wanted. And uh, while they can first calculate the variance of this boundary, of this boundary, inf uh, sorry, the variance of this free energy difference, it's epsilon square times n square. Uh, the, the reason why the assumption that the boundary influence stays above a constant uh, kicks in is because uh, the partial derivatives of this, uh, of this boundary, uh, of this, uh, sorry, the partial derivatives of this free energy difference are given by the boundary influences. So if the boundary influences are larger than, a, uh, than some constants, then we get a lower bound on this partial derivatives. You can either use calculus result in 82, or I think Eisenman and Well provided a uh, self contained computation in their paper. Uh, that's not yet the, 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 the key part of the argument. The key 
uh, technical contribution of Eisman and Well is to show that uh, the, the free energy difference satisfies the Cicciolini theorem. Because a random variable that has variance epsilon square times n square, it, it, it doesn't have, it, it, it does not have to have any probability to be larger than 16 times n. However, if we can show that there's a central limit theorem, then this is like a normal, a normal variable with variance epsilon square times n square, then has a small probability to be larger than 16 times n. Well, small but fixed, which is good enough for us. I mean, small probability depending on epsilon. So this is the key, key technical contribution of uh, Eisenman and Well, and in order to prove this, they have to use some sort of uh, ergodic theory type of arguments. Uh, that's why they, they, did not, they did not get any quantitative decay on the boundary influence. Uh, so that uh, leaves open the question of uh, the decay rate of, uh, of the boundary influence. And this is, there was debate among physicists uh, on this issue too, whether uh, whether there is a transition from polynomial decay in some regime uh, to exponential decay, or whether there is a, uh, whether there is always exponential decay, no matter what is epsilon. Uh, if there is a transition from polynomial decay to exponential decay, this is the so-called uh, BKT transition that would be very interesting. That there were there were supporting arguments in both directions uh, from physics side on this. And uh, for quite some time, there was no, there was not much progress on this problem until uh, quite recently in 2017, Surab Shatterjee proved that uh, an upper bound of one over root log log n uh, using, a, using a different method. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to uh, discuss about it. And then uh, soon after that, Eisman and Pellet proved the polynomial decay where they used the streamlined and enhanced the argument of, uh, of Eisman and Well. Uh, the power, the point here is the power is very small. See, it's e to the minus epsilon minus two. Uh, in fact, if one can prove a polynomial decay with a power strictly larger than one, then using standard arguments for population, uh, this can be enhanced to exponential decay. But the argument Eisenman and the Pellet used uh, does not uh, quite give that. And this was uh, uh, established uh, somewhat like a year later. Uh, it was first proved by uh, Jamin Shah and myself for zero temperature. And uh, a key novelty in this proof is uh, an application of uh, a result of Eisenman Butchat uh, in the 90s on the dimension of geodesics in total speculation system. Uh, afterwards, there were concurrent works by uh, Jamish and myself, and also by Eisenman, Harry, and Pellet uh, to prove exponential decay for positive temperatures. Uh, both proofs employ Eisenman Butchard uh, in basically the same way as, as done for the zero temperature, but addressed the additional difficulties coming from, uh, uh, coming from the positive temperature case uh, uh, in, in, in different manner. So I will not, there's a, yeah, it would take some time to explain what is the Eisman Butchard's result on the, on population and why it is related to the random field AC model. Uh, I choose the different focus for today's talk, which I will jump into details. So I will skip this one. Uh, the, at this point, then we can ask, what is the correlation lines for two-dimensional random field AC model? Uh, because previously we say epsilon small, but it's still fixed. Uh, now we can ask what would happen if epsilon goes to zero. We can ask what is the minimal size of a box to see influence from, uh, from the random field? Because as epsilon goes to zero, if you have a fixed size uh, box, then this, the, the, the the effect from the disorder should vanish. But if the size of the box grow in some certain way, depending on epsilon, then, uh, and then there should be some critical scaling when the, when the disorder started to uh, make a difference. 
that is the definition of our correlation length. Uh, mathematically, uh, say this is defined to be the minimal scale so that the boundary influence is less equal to say a half. Uh, there has been many physics predictions on this, uh, many studies using either uh, simulations or non-regress methods, but there was no consensus even at zero temperature. A common belief was that the correlation length should be e to the epsilon minus two. Uh, there has also been some recent work supported e to the epsilon minus one. On the mathematical side, uh, as a byproduct of Shinterji and Eidman Pellet's work, we have an upper bound of e to the e to the epsilon minus two. So you see that this is uh, still pretty far from what's being uh, predicted. So with the material worth, we show that uh, the scaling is actually e to the epsilon minus four thirds. Uh, we prove this for zero temperature and also the upper bound applies for all positive temperatures. You see that the emergence of this four third exponent was unexpected because it seems it seems faces didn't quite uh, expect this. In retrospect, uh, this is pretty recent and, and we are still in the process of exploring this. It seems this is actually quite closely related to lighting Shaw's grade matching theorem. Well, the theorem basically says if we have n IID uniform points on a unit box, and if we want to match this random points to the grid point to n grid points even if spread it out uh, and you want to do it in the way to minimize the the the, the largest transportation distance by by one of the by one of the points if you want to do that uh, there is a four-third exponent a three-quarter exponent uh, appearing in this uh, transportation in this matching problem and this is uh, quite deeply connected in the mathematical way to, to the for third exponents in our problem. Uh, okay, that's some remarks about this four thirds. And I said that in the work with the uh, worth, we only have upper bound, uh, we only have lower bound at zero temperature. And this was uh, the, the lower bound at, at low temperature was proved also recently uh, in, in my joint work with uh, Zijie Zhuang. Uh, it's quite intuitive that the lower bound should not hold at high temperature, but the regress proof uh, can be seen as a, a corollary of a uh, recent inequality obtained with uh, Rongfeng Song and, uh, and Jian Song. I will discuss this a little bit more. This, I, mean, I, will, I will mention what is this inequality uh, later. Okay. Now, that's so much for two dimensions. Now let's move to three dimensions. In three dimensions and above, uh, the prediction is that at low temperature, small epsilon, there should still be long range order. Uh, the first evidence is from Chalker, Fisher, Felix, Froelich, and Spencer. Uh, they show that with the positive probability, uh, if we look at all the simply connected sets, that contains the origin, the Gaussian volume is dominated by the uh, by the size of the boundary. Well, actually, Tom is in the audience. Their, their result is formulated in a slightly, well, in a different manner, but I just, this is a reformulation of the, of the result. From this, uh, you can, we, we can exclude the, Suppose we are just interested in zero temperature, then you, we can exclude the ground state on the left hand side, where the the origin disagrees with the boundary and also the minus component is a simply connected set. This is not possible as a ground state uh, from Fisher for expansion because if this is the case, we can just flip all the red spins enclosed by the orange boundary and. Uh, by this uh, dominating inequality, by the by, by the inequality that the Gaussian volume is less than the size of the boundary, 
we see that this would further decrease the Hamiltonian and as a result contradict with the definition of, uh, uh, of ground state. However, their results cannot rule out the ground state on the right hand side. That is, we do have a, a red spin at the origin, but the red component is not simply connected. There are holes inside. This is still possible, even in light of uh, their result. So at this point, we still don't know uh, whether the indeed the long range order exists or not. But this does provide very good evidence that the long range order should exist. And as we will show later, in fact, this is perhaps the main te technical input why the long range order exists uh, in this case. Uh, after after this uh, work of uh, Chalk and Fisher for for uh, Svensson, uh, Imbri and Brickman Capiana uh, proved that long range order exists indeed at the zero temperature and the low temperatures. So their main contribution is to control the effect from the sun clusters within sun clusters. In the picture, I draw only two layers of uh, this hierarchical picture, but this uh, holes in holes in holes in holes can continue for whatever uh, levels you like. And their method is, I think it's quite sophisticated. It's uh, they use the involved renormalization group theoretical argument to control this effect. Uh, I will uh, I, I will tell you a bit more in details about this. Uh, in the recent work with the Zhe Zhuang, we we found a simple proof uh, without using renormalization group theory uh, for the for the existence of uh, of long range order in three dimensions and higher. Uh, also, since our proof our proof is not only simpler but also uh, robust, so as as a result, it also gives uh, uh, long range order for the random field pulse model, which is which is new. Pulse is an extension of Eastern where instead of two spins, you can have uh, say three spins uh, on each vertex. Okay, now this is the part I want to jump into a little bit in detail. Uh, I want to tell you what is the key idea in our proof. So here's an overview. Our key insight is that Peel's argument can be extended. This is the very argument I explained at the very beginning of, of my talk. Record that the obstacle for Peel's argument with external field is that is the challenge in keeping track of spin interactions with the disorder after flipping the spin, right? Because if when we flip the spin, the interaction of the with the interaction of the spin with the external field is changed, and that seems to be hard to control. The solution is actually very simple. We just also flip the external field as well. So basically, a one sentence summary of, of our method is instead of fixing the disorder and apply Peirce's argument on spin configurations, we consider the joint space of disorder and the spin configurations, and we apply Peirce's argument in this larger space. So, in order to implement this, we define the joint measure of the disorder and also the spin configurations. Okay. Before we usually look at quantum measure, we fix, we sample a, we sample a, a, a disorder, fix it, and look at the if measure with this uh, with this disorder. But now we look at the joint measure. So our goal is to show under this joint measure, if we have plus boundary conditions, then the origin should be, uh, should be that the probability for the origin to be minus is very small. But then we can show the then we can show the uh, uh, long range order. So now here is the sketch. Uh, it's, this picture is reminiscent of what I showed you uh, at the beginning, right? But there is some difference maybe you, you can note. That is, I put triangles on each, on top of each circles. The circle is a, is a spin. Red is, uh, red is minus, plus is uh, uh, blue is plus. The triangle indicates the sign of the disorder on that vertex. Uh, uh, purple is the plus and uh, green is minus. So now when I apply, when I apply the, the, the pairs argument, when I apply the flip mapping, not only I flip the sign of the spins enclosed by the origin boundary, but I also 
but I also flip the sign of the disorder enclosed by the orange boundary. So you see, that's this is showing the picture. Now we analyze uh, the the this mapping again. We want to analyze the change of probability and also the multiplicity, right? Since the sign of the uh, disorder is also changed, the interaction of the spin and the disorder before and after flipping they are the same. So the only change in Hamiltonian is again now in this uh, uh, along this uh, orange contour. So we get the factor of e to the L over t in probability. And the multiplicity is the same. It's still the number of ways to choose the, the green contours. So it's just exponential in L. So it seems we can conclude that if t is small, just as before, we can conclude that the, the, the probability on the right-hand side, the probability for the configurations on the right-hand side is much larger than the left. So the origin should have very small probability to be minus. That seems to be true, except there's a caveat, because we, we should be a bit more careful. There is the partition function. Uh, the partition function for the easy model, this is the normalization. This is the normalization in the definition of the uh, easy measure. That is changed since the external field is changed. When we apply Pierce argument without external field, the partition function is always fixed. There's, it, because because it's always just the partition function of the easy measure with no external field. But now the partition function, the normalization is changed. When we change the external field, the normalization is changed. We need, to, we need to take that into account. So now let's take a closer look of what happens. Uh, let's write down the density for the joint measure. So this is the density both on the uh, uh, the disorder and also on the spin configuration. The, the, the first term is, this is just product of Gaussian density. The second term is the, is the Gibbs weight, which is exponential of minus one over t times the Hamiltonian divided by the partition function. When I say the probability gained by e to the, e to the l over t, I really meant the, 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 the term on the top increased by a factor of e to the l over t. But we still need to, we still need to control uh, what happens to the, to, the partition, to the partition function, which is the right term here. Okay. Well, okay. So it's clear that since the Gaussian distribution is, sym is, is symmetric, uh, flip the sign doesn't change the density. As I just said, the Hamiltonian decreased by 2L after flipping. So the, the second term, the, the term on the top increased, but we need to uh, control the, the, the red term, which is the partition function. The solution is to show the change of the free energy, which is the log of the partition function divided by L after flipping any component uh, with the boundary size L. Note that this is, this, what, we, what we flip is only simply connected component, right? That's due to the construction of Peale's argument. So here is what uh, fischer frelich spencer kicks in. We can just basically adapt in their proof uh, to show that with high probability, the change of free energy after flipping the sign of disorder in any simply connected component uh, is bounded. Uh, because proving this is not so much more difficult than proving this for what I stated earlier. The, the Gaussian volume is not dominated by the uh, size of the boundary because uh, once you establish a certain concentration property, this is pretty obvious. So, so, so with this, uh, we, can, uh, we can fix the caveat and the complete argument uh, that indeed the, uh, the, the uh, long range order exists. Um, the, this, the, the argument of uh, Fisher Freelich Spencer takes about three pages and then I think writing down this whole argument take another two to three pages for uh, for random field easy model. So it's a pretty short argument now. Now let's take a closer look at three dimensions. So 
with weak disorder, there is a phase transition, right? Because uh, when epsilon is, sorry, when, uh, Because there is long range order at uh, at low temperatures, but uh, at high temperature there is exponential decay. Uh, the question, a natural question, is: Well, we can we can look at the critical temperature with the presence of disorder, and I ask whether disorder strictly decreases the critical temperature. A a more modest question is: Well. At least does this order not increase the critical temperature? Forget about strictly decreasing the temperature. At least it has to go to the direction, right? It can only go, go to one direction. Uh, so basically we want to show that as long as T exceeds the critical temperature without this order, do we always have exponential decay? There has been some work along this direction by Camille, John, and Newman. Uh, they showed that this is true if the temperature is high enough, but they, they cannot quite uh, derive the result all the way approaching the criticality. And uh, uh, in the recent work with uh, Jian Song and Ropon Sang, we showed that this is indeed the case, and we showed this as a corollary of uh, the following uh, inequality for for the for the easy model. Uh, this inequality can be stated in this uh, single sentence. Uh, the boundary influence we can view this as a function of the external field, right? This, we just define that as the difference of the spin average uh, with the plus and the minus boundary conditions. But we also have external field, so this difference is a function. Of, uh, of the external field. If we view this boundary influence as a function of, uh, of the external field, this function is maximized at a zero external field. So that means adding external fields, it doesn't even have to be random, adding any external field can, cannot increase the boundary influence. And as a result, since when T is larger than TC, if there is no external field, we have expansion decay, by this inequality, we get exponential decay also with presence of disorder. Uh, this, uh, this above inequality has many other applications too. And very recently, I think it has been used to derive something for both easy model and log sublab inequality for easy model and also for uh, uh, FIFO models. Uh, however, the question star remains open. We, we thought with this inequality should be more or less, it, it should be not too hard to show that adding random disorder should strictly change the critical temperature. But we tried, we tried with quite some effort and so far we couldn't succeed. Of course, you can ask even more challenging question, uh, like what happens at the new critical temperature with the presence of disorder? But this, this, this could be, this could be very hard because uh, our understanding for three D easing without disorder uh, uh, remains limited. Even even at a criticality, even to show the magnetization goes to zero, uh, it's very recent. It's a very recent result and uh, uh, proved by by uh, Michael. Uh, 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 Dominia Copain and uh, 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 I forgot whether it's Vincent Tassang or, or Veladas. Uh, sorry about that. I think it's Veladas for this one, but Michael can correct me if I remember the wrong. Uh, <laughs> there are some future directions. Uh, I guess one natural direction is uh, so for the results, I Explained, especially in two dimensions for the, I mean, for the uh, 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 decay of the boundary influence. Eisman Wells results is that's the qualitative result it applies to a wide class of models, including pots, X, Y, and spin glasses. But all the other models that is quantitative uh, only applies to easing models because 
uh, it used the uh, monotonicity of, uh, of easing. Uh, in a recent work of uh, Ariel Harry and Pallet, they derived some quantitative bounds on non monotone models. Uh, though I think it's fair to say their bounds seem to be still uh, quite a bit away from what uh, one would expect. So, an interesting challenge next is, for instance, take the random field of possible model in two dimensions. Uh, can we always prove there is a exponential decay? Uh, also, can we uh, compute the exact scaling for for the uh, correlation length for for random field of possible model? I think one side is easy, but the other side is the monotonicity. I quite I cannot quite remember on my my brain what is uh, which side is uh, which side is the is the side that used the monotonicity. Uh, another direction is one can look at uh, scaling limits. Uh, uh, Bodwich and and Sun look at the scaling limits of the mechanization field uh, at critical temperature, uh, but the 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 disorder strength is uh, is it's carefully chosen. Uh, the vanishes as a power law that where the power is carefully chosen. In this case, they, uh, they can derive the limit and show that it's singular uh, to the limit with no external field uh, constructed by Kenyo, Gabin, and Newman. Uh, and another set of questions one can ask is, well, what about the scaling limits of uh, interface? For instance, uh, what suppose we we are even at zero temperature and uh, in the hexagonal hexagonal uh, lattice uh, we look at the we look at the ground state with the weak disorder and should the interface uh, converge to SA6 that 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 seems to be a hard problem too I guess uh, I guess I finished the uh, Few minutes earlier than what you have uh, uh, expected, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, John. This was an absolutely wonderful talk, beautiful summary, spectacular deep new results, and interesting open questions. So uh, um, I think there'll be a great deal of discussion. Let's uh, look, uh, people who want to talk, please turn on your video so we can see you. And let's start the question period. Thank, thanks. Uh, beautiful work, uh, Jen. I really think it's great stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about this uh, latent shore grid matching yeah uh, that that, yeah. that uh, you yeah. mentioned it but I, I i don't know what it is and it sounds interesting yeah i I'm just about to ask the same thing <laughs> right so it took me quite took us quite some time to understand there's some connection too uh basically <clears throat> basically you want to you have this collection of random points right uniform id you want to match them to the deterministic grid points on the lattice. And you want to ask yourself, you want to do it, you know, it, there are two types of uh, uh, optimization you can think of. One is to minimize the sum of the transportation distance. This is the AKT uh, matching theorem that has a root log n. But you can also try to minimize the, the worst transportation distance. This, this is the light and short theorem. Why is this related to random field easing? It goes through the greedy lattice animal. And the one key concept here is the horse criterion. In, horse criterion says that if you have, suppose for every element i, I give you a set, okay? Uh, AI suppose that. For each element, I give you a set AI. And I suppose now, no matter which subsets of integers you take, on the right-hand side, 
you take the corresponding union of the sets I give you. And suppose the cardinality of the union on the left hand side is less than the cardinality of the union on the right hand side. Suppose that's the condition, then you can find a matching from, from your numbers i, one to uh, i is one dot 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 n, to the right hand side so that the matching, that the image is always in the set a, a sub i. So basically, what does that mean? That means now on each great point, you can try to draw some sort of ball, right? This is your, this is, this, this plays the role of A sub I. Each, so each great point is like one dot 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 N and you draw a ball around it. This ball, the, the number of random points in this ball is plays the role of A sub I. If the, if now you take any set of great points, if the cardinality of this of this uh, of set of this set is less than the cardinality of the union of the corresponding random points you have, then that means a matching is possible. So, Light and Short's uh, matching theorem can be translated to ask, what is the minimal radius of this ball so that uh, when you take a, a, a subset, when you take any subset of the grid points. The cardinality is dominated by the corresponding uh, the, the the number of random points in the corresponding boards, right? And then you think a little bit about it. This is really like asking. I mean, imagine the worst set you can take is simply connected. Then it's it's like asking which set you can take so that you have to expand but this much in order for the in order for the number of random points is larger than the number of uh, uh, grid points in the set you take, right? But the the fluctuation of the the fluctuation of the uh, 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 random points in in any set is like a Gaussian. So this is like okay, you want to take you want to find a set so that the Gaussian volume is divided by the boundary because you expand from the boundary, right? When you draw the boards, you really, the expansion only comes from the boundary. It's the size of the boundary times the radius of the ball you draw. That's the, the, that's the amount of expansion you have. That's why this corresponds to the problem of uh, what is the worst set you can find in, 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 in order to uh, maximize the the ratio of the Gaussian volume divided by the size of the boundary. And this is also the key that governs the behavior of the random field EC model. Sorry, I don't know whether I made myself clear, but this this so, connection is via. So how do you get four thirds? Yeah, that that take that 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 I have to show you some slides. I I don't <laughs> think I can I, I'm not sure I even succeeded in explaining the connection. So I'm sure I will not succeed in explaining this for thirds without without anything to show you. So, <laughs> but basically, with basically, it's like you want to construct this set that so that the Gaussian volume beats the size of the boundary. The trick is you add triangles recursively. Uh, we thought we we thought we discovered this, but only recently we realized. Light and Shore has this exactly the similar idea. They add the recursively added triangles to build their matchings. It's quite oh. well, uh, where realistic. is the Light and Shore paper? Where is it? Yes. It's I mean it's published, I think it's in 80s or, or 90s. It's pretty old. It's just the people who thought about the question in random field that I sent either are not familiar with the light and shore. Or like me, have crossed it for a few times, but never draw the connection until we we spend a great deal of amount of work, and then in retrospect we realize, oh, there seems to be a connection. Uh, we're still in the process of exploring it because there are more questions one can ask on the matching side. Uh, yeah, it's less on less on the random field Eastern side at the moment, but more on the matching side. But they. But there's this connection that uh, uh, we are still in the process of digesting, but this is 
Have you tried to see if your methods are applicable to solve some of the big open problems for non-random systems? I really didn't quite see that. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not even sure what is the big, I mean, the big open problem in a non-random set, I, I don't know, I, I mean. Well, does the Heisenberg it, in two dimensions have exponential decay? Oh yeah, right. Very good question. We tried that, we, we didn't see how to, we didn't see how you can come up with some sort of random field in this deterministic Heisenberg model. Uh, we tried some other things too, but none of them, none of them seem to work and none of them seem to be even worth reporting. Are there other questions? Tom, it looks like you, oh, Michael. Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's a pleasure to see uh, new ideas inject, injected uh, to the field. So really, congratulations on beautiful results. Uh, it's a pleasure to see them. Uh, now, two two interesting open problems, uh, and great. It's great that uh, Tom Spencer is here because he made also some initial contribution, participated in initial contributions on the Harris criterion. Uh, so there is something called the Harris criterion, which uh, supposedly uh, indicates uh, when would the critical exponents be affected by the disorder. Would be nice to make some progress on that. And given that you found how to use previous uh, uh, multiscale analysis of uh, Tom and collaborators, I think it was Froelich and Chase, perhaps, or, sorry, Daniel Fisher and Chase. Maybe interesting to look into that. The other is, uh, can you uh, say something about the even two-dimensional uh, uh, Edwards Anderson spin glass model? There, there, is, there persists difference between Parisi school, if I'm not mistaken, and the other uh, schools of thought on uh, the question of uh, multiplicity of gr just ground state configurations, even. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michael, for two fantastic questions. Uh, the first question, yes, we, we had that in mind. We mean, I present in a way that whether the disorder changes the critical temperature because that's more related, directly related to the inequality we, we proved. Uh, I guess the more interesting and most likely more challenging problem is whether the critical exponents would change uh, with the presence of disorder. I really have no clue. Uh, Rongfeng showed me some sort of uh, heuristic calculations, but um, we are we are not quite able to understand the, even the physics picture yet. And, and to be honest, I don't even know how to imagine a proof uh, at the moment for those questions. Uh, well, for one thing, the critical exponents without external field, I don't think we were able to compute it at the moment, right? So one has to compare somehow when the critical temperature changed. Yeah, that's it's a great question. And we want to first solve the more modest question whether the temperature changes and we didn't succeed yet. And after that, maybe we have the courage to look into that. Uh, for the question of the spin glasses uh, in two dimensions, uh, I guess you are asking whether there are congruent uh, it was this un, uh, congruent uh, uh, ground state pairs uh, with, with this unique. Yeah, the, the sort of, I mean, basically it's the sort of idea you used with a well, you, you hope that can be implemented, but without monotonicity, it becomes a bit, it becomes a bit uh, unclear. Yeah. And, we actually tried, but mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything to report at the moment because, yeah, the 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 intuition what we thought was related to random field is thing. It probably is, but just without monotonicity, it it was it was fairly difficult to to try to understand what happens. There are many questions in the. Uh, for, for 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 spin glasses, I think one of them is like, uh, for instance, 
Okay, I can't, I can't, sorry, maybe I shouldn't go into details because it has been a while for me to think about. It. To answer your questions short, uh, we don't know how the method can be applied to these problems, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not because of lack of trying. I see. But I, I want to say that you injected so many beautiful ideas to the subject that I, I don't want the questions to overshadow that. The, those <laughs> questions, we, yeah, all these questions we really like, uh, but yeah, they, they just seem to be so hard. What those open questions from 80s and 90s, they, yeah, I, they don't, we don't seem to have more tools to understand. I don't know, yeah, them, I think they're, they're pretty hard. Uh, there's some work on that direction by Newman Stein, but I guess they don't quite fully answer the question you asked. They, they, they know something in the in the half plane via the meta states, uh, but one would like to know more. I think uh, not. Yeah, I, I didn't see how to how to how to, how to do that. Thank you. So, are there other questions? I see other experts in the audience. I wonder. Well, John, I think you've overwhelmed us. And I want to thank you for staying up past 1130 at night to give us oh, this beautiful, beautiful talk. We look thank forward you for to your hearing hearing what comes next. <laughs> uh, th th thanks, uh, we, we will try, but the, this, the things are hard. <laughs> well, that hard makes it interesting. I, I take that as encouragement. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very th much. Thanks for, your, thanks for your attention and thanks for your questions. Uh, See you next week. Bye. Bye.